Hi, this is Carsten from UFO Denmark. Today we are so pleased to have Ben Emblin Jones on the show. Ben, can you please introduce yourself? Hello, Carsten. Hello, Astrid. Hello, everyone else who is watching this. Um, my name is Ben Emlyn Jones, and some of you will know me because I actually, um, just under two years ago, I actually came to Denmark to do a talk for you at UFO Denmark, and I had a really, really great couple of days with you, with you guys, and I did a very interesting discussion. And um, what I'm going to bring for you today is something of an update. I am British, and I am interested in UFOs and all their associated works. And uh, for this reason, I've been studying very carefully the whole UFO situation at the moment, because we're now, um, yesterday was Boxing Day of 2020, and it's roughly the 40th anniversary of the Randlesham Forest incident. And I think that's, uh, that's something very significant. I'll just uh, show you, just, uh, this is really quite an amazing thing. And of course, the, the Randlesham Forest incident, I'm sure you're all familiar with, because it's one of the most famous UFO incidents in the world. And what makes it such a um, significant event is that uh, research and evidence gathering began very quickly as a result of this. Um, it's now 40 years ago yesterday, the early hours of Boxing Day in 1980, that strange craft started appearing around an American airbase in Suffolk in England. And since then, there's been all kinds of contention over what's ha what actually happened there. However, there's no doubt at all, something very, very strange took place on that evening, on, on that night and that early, that early morning period in 1980. And indeed, at least one other day after that, something strange happened as well. And um, the 40th anniversary would normally be would normally be very active in terms of there being a conference. What would normally happen is what happened in the 30th anniversary, which I, I was lucky enough to attend. There was a big conference in Woodbridge Town Hall in the local area, which is traditional for this people doing conferences about this event. And then we'd all have a walk around the forest. Which, and unfortunately, because of the coronavirus pandemic, that hasn't been possible. There have been no live events at all associated with this particular, this particular incident and the anniversary, this amazing 40th anniversary, except uh, like uh, events like this. So there's been basically people getting onto Skype or Zoom and discussing it in this way. So this is kind of a 40th anniversary conference. <coughs> That's all it is. Um, it's really amazing to think that um, this hasn't gone away. I mean, this, this is something that has lingered. And many, many people have taken an interest in this, even those, even people who were, who were have been born since it happened. The BBC did an article about this. You may have seen it floating around. Rendlesham Forest UFO. Are we closer to the truth 40 years ago? This is by Nick Rigby, which was posted on Boxing Day on the BBC website. And I won't, I won't go into details about this because it's really not very interesting. There's absolutely nothing here that's new. There, it goes through the usual. It begins with the whole lighthouse theory, which is a provable nonsense. This was actually something suggested by Vince Thurkettle, who was a, he was a teenager at the time who uh, worked in the forest. Um, and um, it was, this was picked up by someone called Ian Redpath, Ian Ridpath, who was an astronomer, and they claimed that there was there were no aliens at all. There was just a lighthouse. There was something called the Orford Nest Lighthouse, which is on the coastline. Um, it's a tall lighthouse. The area around there is very flat, so it is the light's actually visible from some parts of the forest, although not from the part of the forest where some where most of the action appeared to happen. And uh, what's more, the the lighthouse is a very well known local landmark. And everyone in the area knows about it. You can see, everyone knows, everyone can see it. It's um, very bright and it shines out to sea. It also shines, it actually shines also inland. Although there is actually a, there was actually a, a, um, a plate that was put over one side of it facing the base. That's what I heard. Not, not the forest, but the base. That was simply because um, they were worried about the light distracting aircraft landing and taking off from the base. But, um, 
Third, third Kettle and Ridpath basically said, there's nothing alien about what happened here. All these, all these witnesses saw was the lighthouse, which is bizarre. It's a bizarre theory, not least because the, um, it doesn't match the witness statements, but also these people were familiar with the local area. They were, they were highly trained in US Air Force security police. It's, it's kind of job where you need to, you need to be on your toes. And they, these were security specialists who'd been through a, a, year, a year or more of training altogether to get, where, to get to where they were now. It's unlikely that they would have made a mistake like that. Um, and um, then the, the article goes on to discuss Colonel Charles Holt and his, and his encounter and the famous tape that he made. He did like a dictaphone recording. And um, you all, and then it just goes on. It goes on talking about what's been done by the Forestry Commission. They've actually, they've actually got something called the UFO Trail. So if you go there, it's, they, they're catering to tourists, the people interested in UFOs. You can actually go on a little pathway around the woods, and there's little markers. And it's called the UFO Trail, and it has a little alien face on it. it has a little alien face, and you can follow it around. And they've got a sculpture, a big um, thing made out of cast steel, a painted black. Um, it supposedly looks like the UFO. There used to be three wooden logs that have been jammed into the ground, I remember. Um, but uh, they've actually got a sculpture now, which is, is, doesn't actually, it only vaguely resembles the, the witness testimony from the first night, that is Burroughs Peniston. It's got some strange markings on it that don't look like the things that were in Peniston's notebook. Um, Larry Warren calls it the lemon squeezer because that's what it looks like. It's, it's not, you see, According to some of the witnesses, it's in the wrong place anyway. <clears throat> There's a lot of contention over what happened. Luckily, the article does mention Brenda Butler, who um, they did actually bring her up. And she's one of the few people who've, who's actually made, she kept the, the light of common sense and science burning through this whole charade of disinformation. And so I was very pleased that she actually was featured in this in this particular article she's one of the, she's the co-author of sky crash which is one of the most which is a book came out in 1986 which, which is absolutely a classic ufo book when it comes to this particular event there's been several books that have been written since none of them are as good as this this is a really an excellent one um the exception possibly being left at east gate by larry warren and peter robbins now um Dot Street, one of her co-authors, stands by what was written in that book. But Jenny Randalls, the third author, who's probably the most well-known of the three, who's now a, she's a very famous ufologist, she's now really, I don't know if she's actually done it formally, but she's really denounced what she said before about almost everything to do with UFOs. She wrote a book called UFOs That Never Were, with um, not with uh, Brenda Butler and Dot Street, with Dr. David Clark and Andy Roberts, two big UFO skeptics. And I wonder, I wonder why she's changed her mind so suddenly. It's very disappointing, actually, that Jenny Randalls has, has changed her mind so much. Now, what's made things more confusing is that the whole, the whole of the Rendlesham Forest incident was turned on its head by an, an incredible, um, very dismaying conflict that broke out in 2016 involving Larry Warren. It was revealed, supposedly it was revealed suddenly by a researcher that he'd made his entire story up. This was accompanied by much, much more um, unrelated incidents, unrelated, um, unrelated crimes that he'd committed. This researcher supposedly dug up um, information that he'd been, he was a con man. He made a fortune uh, selling fake antiques, rock and roll memorabilia, things like this. All kinds of things like this. Now, um, that caused a huge amount of confusion and a huge amount of turmoil. And in, a, in a, an event where there's already a lot of uncertainty and people are not sure what to think, this was absolutely devastating. It sort of went away. The last two years or so have been quite quiet in that respect. But the... I've looked into this myself. I've done a lot of research into this, and I found out that the uh, the allegations made against Larry Warren were a complete fabrication. They were concocted by someone who used to be a friend of his, very close friend, 
and was basically pursuing a vendetta because they they had a big bust up. They'd been friends, but they had a massive falling out. So um, she made this up because she was angry with him. And it's that's, that seems to be calming down now, luckily. So hopefully, we're hoping to get research back on track now. There's a film coming out called Capel Green, which I hope would actually be released by now. I was, I was sure they were going to release it on the 40th anniversary. I mean, that just seemed a very an iron that was too hot not to strike, as we say in England. But uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been. It's, we're still waiting for it. It's still being edited and still being messed around with um, and being perfected by the director and the editing team. So um, got, a, got a bit of a way to go then. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Mm, hope you can all see that. <clears throat> now, for those of you who were here, we, who were at the meeting in Copenhagen um, in uh, last year, um, I mentioned this was the first time. This was, that was that meeting was very was uh, very historical because it was the first time ever that this particular UFO event had been mentioned outside of Britain. This is the first time it ever went international. I actually had a phone call from someone a few, I think I mentioned this at the meeting. I, I think I had, I had a phone call from somebody a couple of days before I left for Denmark. Someone I don't know, a perfect stranger, who told me not to talk about this event. He said it, he said it wouldn't be a good idea. The, the main witness was a, was, a, was a con woman fooling me, and I shouldn't mention this event when I went to Denmark. Well, I did anyway. <laughs> And you'll be pleased to know, this is still an active case. There's, since I spoke to you last, I've spoken to another witness. Another guy has come forward who actually saw the strange object. Now, what you see there, it's a picture I actually made myself. So it's not, I know it's not the best artwork in the world because it's, it's something I'd made myself. There are some better versions of this. I haven't um, had permission to share, to actually share them with you, but you can find them. But um, as you see, there's this large, what triangular shaped object. It was very dark colored, it was, um, brown. The, the, the main witness, Kaz Clark, describes it as being brown that appeared above this little village in South Wales. And it had, um, it had a textured surface and there were lights surrounding it, these red lights surrounding the perimeter of the triangle. One of the sides was slightly curved. It wasn't a complete triangle, as you can see here. Apparently I got it the wrong way around. The actual object was the curved side was downwards, but there was a big light, a big white light at one end and like um, there seemed to be electrical discharges as if there was lightning coming off it towards the ground. And um, in the area where that lightning touched down, the, the trees, one of the trees died, things like that. There were aircraft in the area. There was other strange objects nearby, these little red and green things. There was a green ball that seemed to be, it almost like it, there was an aircraft flying by. And as you can see, it was actually shooting beams of light towards the aircraft. Although it, this doesn't appear to be any kind of weapon. The aircraft was not harmed, as far as we know. Now, Cass Clark, Cass Clark is she's been quite good because she's quite a good, she's quite a good witness. She's a very good witness. She can speak properly about things. She's done her own presentation. She went to the Cornwall UFO group last year, and she did a long presentation all about this, including what happened afterwards. And she showed the photograph she took of strange people in the area um, following this event, the, the day after and for the next couple of days, there were some strange people hanging around on the ground in the, in the fields where this happened near the, near the, near the woods. Now um, they were wearing these orange jackets and, and um, white overalls, rather like a police, a police forensic team. And um, she went to ask them, there were, there were about a dozen of these people or more and she went to ask them what they were doing and they said they are with, with vodafone that is a mobile phone company and they were installing a um, they were, were just were vodafone engineers however some of them were armed some of them had holsters with with pistols in now uh, i don't think vodafone engineers walk around tooled up as they say so that was a very very strange that was a very strange thing now i spoke to a man who didn't want to be identified. I mean, he's, um, he was a guy who lived in a local area, had to travel back to the area. And I uh, met, met him. He doesn't want to be identified. He doesn't want any publicity. He's not, he's not fame, seeking fame or fortune. And he told me basically what, what Kaz had told me, almost exactly. Kaz left me alone with him and so that um, 
I could speak to him independently, and he told me basically the same story. Gary Jones, the guy who, the field researcher who'd been investigating this, he's still on the case. He's still looking into it. We're hoping, um, what we'd like to do is get more witnesses coming forward. He's done a, like a, he's done a, a study of the local area, studying the wildlife, the dead tree. He's um, been taking electromagnetic readings and things like that. Um, the areas where this lightning appeared to touch the ground, all the plant life died. It's very strange. Now, I some of you might have seen this. Now, this is this was a really, really weird thing, but um, these monoliths have been appearing everywhere. Now, this was the first one. This was in Utah, USA, where this strange object, it was uh, a, a prism, a triangular prism, sticking upright out of the ground, appeared in the desert. Now, um, it was all a bit of a mystery where it's, this is still a mystery where this comes from. The, um, the the Google Earth images indicate it was put there five years ago. Now, people started visiting the location, and they saw it was actually because it was actually was made. It was made out of sheets of metal with rivets securing them. So this is obviously a man-made object, but um, no one seems to know who made it or why. I mean, I wondered if there might be bones inside it. I thought, could this be some kind of weird coffin that someone had decided to? Uh, to be buried in. I mean, people do that sort of thing. But um, it turns out it wasn't because someone, a local person came along and took it away because they were worried about the environmental damage that would be caused, not by the monolith itself, but by people visiting it. Because people, if lots of people travel there, they're going to drop litter and things like that. And he was worried about the, the impact that would have on the desert ecology. Um, but since then, about a hundred others have appeared. There's like a database of them. And they keep popping up everywhere. So it appears this is some kind of weird modern art craze, I suppose you could call it, a real life meme, rather like those naked Trump statues that started popping up all over the place a few years ago and the people dressing up as clowns and walking along the streets. What's interesting about this from a, from a UFO point of view is that um, it seems to have, rather like crop circles, I mean, crop circles are unlike the, the monolith i mean there is some question mark over the origins of crop circles i'll come to that in a minute this is these these clearly are man-made man -made, at least all the ones that have been examined so far have been man-made although um i thought it would be incredibly ironic if they came across one that turned out to be made by the aliens after all this but um what it's done is it clearly shows the very fact that people are calling it a monolith because it's not a mon a monolith actually means something made of stone but it, in popular culture, it refers to something from Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey, the book and the film. And a it's a large black rectangular object that is described as being made of some weird material which you can't touch properly. You, you can't get a purchase on it with your fingers, that kind of thing. It indicates that the, there is an awareness and an interest in things not of this world. So what, regardless of the origins of these objects, even though they are, for, for, I've got no reason to think they're not all man-made. It shows that there is a, then people, whenever something strange like, thing, like this happens, people's eyes turn upwards to the stars automatically, which this, is, this indicates that it's, it's, a, it's a popular idea. The idea of UFOs is popular, very popular indeed. And then we come on to crop circles. Now, this, is, this year has been very, very interesting, I think, for people who research crop circles because crop circles are a form of landscape art for the most part. People go out and make them. Um, I don't know if you know Matthew Williams. I think everyone's heard of him. He's a bit of a character. He, he makes these. There's several other people I know who make them. This is, it's quite famous. But every so often, um, circles appear in which the origin can't be trace back to any of these people who make them. The, me the methods by which they're produced, the, the form of, the, of the, the way the circle's put out, does indicate that um, something other than human hands is making these things. Now, 2020 represented something a quite important, um, a quite important opportunity because we, ha ha we had a full national lockdown through the summer, which meant that, um, 
we had an opportunity, in a sense, this created an experimental control because the question always was how many of these things, how many of these crop circles are actually made by humans and how many are not? And you get all kinds of um, estimates. Some people say, oh, it's, there's a few man-made ones, all the others are the aliens. Some people say none of them are the aliens. The, the popular is none of these are alien-made at all. Now, what was predicted was there would be none at all because the crop circle teams wouldn't be able to get out to operate. However, I, I, spe I speculated that there would be a few. There would be fewer than number, but there would be some. Some of them would be made by people who managed to escape, you know, managed to dodge the police and get to where they needed to to make these crop circles. But what it meant was that the ratio between the interesting ones and the ones that are very, very clearly man-made would be smaller. So it, makes, it would make research an awful lot easier. And indeed, this one did appear, actually. This, uh, on June the 9th, we got our first crop circle, which was this one. It looks like uh, someone's dropped an egg on the floor. That's what it looks like to me. Big splatting noise. I don't know who made this. I know Matthew Williams went there with his drone and he photographed it. Um, but this was one of um, a smaller number than usual that appeared because of the lockdown. Now, there's been no major up updates on the Nottinghamshire Roswell case that I talked about last time. This was something that happened near Nottingham in England in 1987 when something very very strange happened which involved lights in the sky loud noises and something that crashed to the earth as i, I describe it in detail in the first talk i did for for ufo denmark um there's been no major updates however there is now a, a lot of interest in this and there's a fact someone not me somebody completely unknown to me created a facebook group called the knots roswell and it's got a quite a number of members i didn't check how many members it's got and i've been approached by uh somebody who, who um wants to make a documentary about this so well there was a couple of months ago i spoke to him and he hasn't got back to me but i'll let you know if anything happens in that respect now this is really weird this is this is high shed this happened just to, this happened last month now he is a professor and he's a general in the israeli ministry of defense and he came out with something really strange a little while ago. Um, because, of course, interest in UFOs up, up until now, really, in popular culture has been, it's had the image of the kind of um, the overgrown kid, you know, someone with an anorak and a woolly hat, someone, someone with a telescope who, who goes out at night. Um, <coughs> it's... What the skeptics don't don't really acknowledge is that there's many so-called respectable people who talk about this. I mean, there's scientists, pioneers, astronauts, um, even the first British person in space, Helen Sharman, mentioned that she believes in alien life. And um, and now we've got this this chap here called Haima Shed has spoken now. Now he's a senior figure in the Ministry of Defence, and he's been heading the space division. Because you know, we know that the United States of America now has a space force, but they're not the only country that has that. There's a space division of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. And um, the Jerusalem Post published an article where he, this man said that UFOs are real. Um, Israel and the United States have been dealing with them together for many years. He and President Trump in the US know all about this. And he says this, con this contact in involves a... The quote that was in the Jerusalem Post was Galactic Federation, which is a bit uh, Star Trekky. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit far out there. It's not a very scientific term, but he said that there was a group of aliens in this Galactic Federation, and they had arranged secret treaties with the with the with the governments in on Earth, Israel, United States. There's a secret base on the planet Mars where humans and aliens regularly meet, and. Um, Apparently, President Trump was on the verge of doing disclosure when this Galactic Federation told him not to. He felt that people were not ready on Earth. Um, now, what's interesting is this, this article was not originally in English. There was originally a version of it on something called um, ynet.il. .il, and uh, that's the original source for the Jerusalem Post document. It's in Hebrew. It's a language I can't speak. But I, uh, I did get it translated, and it turns out that um, it, it turns out strange enough that um, 
the term Galactic Federation, the, the bit where it says Galactic Federation, what I what it translated as through the auto translator I used was actually space unity. Space unity, which is um it's sound which is very it's um if you if you speak English as your first language, it has a very, very different feel to Galactic Federation. It sounds a lot more sensible than Galactic Federation. So I do wonder if the term Galactic Federation was kind of made up by the, tra the original translator. But I thought that was a, that was a very, very strange eventuality there. I didn't ex that's, no one expected anyone like Haima Shed to say this sort of thing. And of course, we now um, have these images, which are, everyone now is familiar with. It's in a way, from December 2017, we've been in a different kind of UFO era in the way that UFOs are portrayed in the media. The period from 1947, that's 70 whole years of official ridicule, and, official ridicule and denial, appears to have been replaced by a new kind of strategy in dealing with this. The reasons why, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons why that might be, about what it might mean. I'm not, I don't have all the answers to that, but it must have happened for a purpose. But we have here these, Im these, these images, these stills from this footage that has appeared from the US Navy. Little bit by bit more information has come out about this. And since I last spoke to you, it, this has been confirmed as real. Um, there's even a unidentified aerial phenomena, which is the term they're using now instead of UFO, an unidentified aerial phenomena task force that's been set up which is going to, twice a year, it's going to make a, a public report. So this is really quite something extraordinary that's happening. Um, this doesn't mean that, that everything that we're going to hear is the truth. Absolutely not. This could be just another form of the cover-up. However, it's interesting, extremely interesting, this eventuality has occurred. Now, just, to, just a week after Jaime Shedd said what he did, this man started speaking up about it. This is John Brennan. Now, he's a former head of the CIA. He started saying lots of strange things about UFOs, which I've never heard anyone in his position say before. He basically started saying the kind of things that people like, like us have been saying for years. Um, which I, I was astonished to hear what he said. He said... Um, I think some of the phenomena we're going to be seeing continues to be unexplained and might, in fact, be some kind of phenomenon that is the result of something that we don't yet understand. And that could involve some kind type of activity that some might say constitutes a different form of life. That's a very long, very garbled sentence, which displays nervousness um, and his awareness of the implications of what he's just said. Um, and it came not long after he described the ATIP and TTSA material, the, the footage that we've all heard about, we've all seen from the US Navy, as quite eyebrow raising. He also noticed he, he, when he, what he says is very interesting. He also says the phenomena we're going to be seeing. Now, that's the, he's using the, the future tense. Does that mean there's more coming that he knows about? Hmm. And he also said, you try to ensure that you have as much data as possible in terms of visuals and also different types of maybe technical collection of the sensors that you have. Now, this has often been referred to several times by several witnesses over the last couple of years that there's, it's not just video that's there. There are things such as radar logs, firing solutions, and other things that have been, that are known to exist. It's quite possible but the only reason these haven't been published yet is not because it's nothing to do with the context of the UFOs, but simply because they might reveal the capabilities of the ships. That's one of the US Navy's most closely guarded secrets. And this happened in just a couple of weeks. I think it was, it was 10 days after Jaime Shed of the Israeli Space Force and made his announcement. And I 
find it hard to believe that's a coincidence. These out two outbursts coming close too close together, it seems really quite ex extraordinary. Now, the current head of the CIA, someone called Gina Hespel, a Trump appointee, is she going to say something similar in official in her official capacity? Because um, the U.S. is going through a turbulent period at the moment because President Trump is challenging the results of the recent election. Joe Biden is supposedly supposed to be becoming the new president, but he's not the president yet. And I do wonder if, if uh, in this chaotic in this chaotic situation any kind of information might come about simply as a result of this conflict going on over the results of the election so um well no 20th of january is when the new presence is ignore, inaugurated so something could happen within the next couple of weeks you never know now most of what i've been talking about so far centers around the united states of america because when it comes to ufology and exopolitics um it's centered on that country for whatever reason but to understand the present we need to go back to the past and find out where all this came from and believe it or not the it's not always been centered on the usa now this is a lot this is a lovely picture here of a lovely place you could just see that beach there um you see the deck chairs and the palm trees i just it's a place i'd love to go to i would love to uh, take my shoes and socks off and paddle in that sea, definitely. Now that is actually Grenada, which is a little island in the Caribbean. It's a, it's a popular tourist destination. There's usually a cruise ship moored outside the harbor there and people basically enjoying that lovely beach. And it's famous for, like much of the Caribbean, it's famous for its good weather, easy going lifestyle, friendly people. It's a lovely place to go on holiday. There's nothing in that image which reveals to you that much of the modern UFO era of what we're seeing today kind of started right there. There's nothing in that picture to indicate that's the case, but really this could be described as the birthplace of exopolitics, modern exopolitics as we know it. Do any of you recognize this individual? It's not Eddie Murphy. It looks like him a bit, but it's not actually. This is Sir Eric Gary. He was the first prime minister of Grenada elected to office in uh, February of 1974, when the island became independent from the, from the British Empire. And it was a previously a crown colony of, of Britain and be became an independent nation. This guy, this, this man uh, was campaigned for independence through, through his entire political career and became the first prime minister. Now, what's interesting about this, what's interesting about the whole thing is this guy was really interested in UFOs. He was really interested in UFOs. This is the uh, this was taken in 1978. This picture in the United Nations headquarters in New York City, and it's a very important historical document because on the left there you can see Sir Eric, and to his right are J. Allen Hynek, and then Jacques Vallée, and Colonel Larry Coyne, three very prominent ufologists. And as you see here, he was so keen on UFOs <clears throat> that he had the Grenada Post Office issue some special stamps. I don't know if any of you are into stamp collecting, but this is really a very, very, if you can get hold of one of these, let me know. Because um, here you see, this is the presentation document here, 7th of October, 1977. This is the uh, 32nd regular session of the General Assembly of the United Nations, which he commemorated with a special stamp. And it says here, uh, two dollars that's Grenadian dollars research into UFOs this Eric and there you see the United Nations headquarters now if you look to the top left do you see the little flying saucer now that might have been inspired by a real sighting in uh, May of 1973 by John Lennon the, of the Beatles because he described seeing a UFO at that location right back then so believe it or not, Sir Eric Gary spoke at the first ever International UFO Congress in uh, Acapulco, Mexico, in, in that same year, 1977. And um, this is not, it's actually not the same UFO Congress as the one in, in the States, but it was the original one. Now, I can't imagine, it seems hard to imagine that um, any prime minister or president would speak at 
at any UFO conference, I'm a, a UFO conference. Can you imagine your prime minister in Denmark? I don't know who that is, but can you imagine them speaking at your meeting? It seems incredible. He's, this is the first and only time that a serving head of government has actually spoken at a UFO conference. There's been other people within government who've spoken. I mean, there's people like uh, you know, Paul Hellier, who's a defense minister of Canada. He has, but um, actually a head of government, a prime minister, a president. That's only happened once, and that was him, Sir Eric Gary. It's not the first time the UN, the United Nations and UFOs have incidentally rubbed up several times before. That is Javier Perez de Cuella. He was the Secretary General of the United Nations. On your right, you see a lady called Linda Napolitano, who lives, lived in New York, still lives there now, actually. Now, she was abducted by aliens, and um, she's claimed that. Now, what's really remarkable about this particular abduction is there is possibly independent witnesses. Bob uh, Bud Hopkins wrote about this in his book on the subject, that uh, two of Mr. de Cuella's personal security team witnessed this event a very interesting story indeed and ac this is sir eric there with uh, president carter in the oval office when he'd just been having a meeting there with him and um believe it or not on the 18th of december 1978 this actually happened this is un general assembly decision 33 426 this is an absolutely extraordinary document because it says this is the General Assembly released this decision. The establishment of an agency or a department of the United Nations for undertaking, coordinating, and disseminating the results of research into unidentified flying objects. This is the 87th plenary meeting, 18th of December, 1978. And it's, it goes on to more detail here. It talks more about, um, it says here, the General Assembly takes note of the statements made and the draft solutions resolutions submitted by Grenada at the 32nd and 33rd sessions. That's when the stamps were released. Basically, Sir Eric wanted the United Nations to start investigating UFOs seriously. And it goes, there's more details here, this document. You can find it if you go to the United Nations website archive, it's various, the various resolution archives, it's there. Under that reference, you can find it. That's where I found this. It's Darren Black and White Squire, as we say in England. Really quite astonishing. And there was even talk about having the the third International UFO Congress on Grenada. But nothing came of that. Like, unfortunately, it all went terribly, terribly wrong. Because not long after that particular meeting, this guy, Morris Bishop, staged a coup d'etat against Gary's government. And what happened was... Um, so Eric was actually in New York at the time. He was having a consultation with, with Kurt Waldheim, who was the UN Secretary General at the time. And he received news from home that he could never go, he couldn't go home because Morris Bishop, his political rival, had taken power in a coup d'etat. He'd smuggled guns and other weapons onto the island and marched into the parliament buildings and announced that he and his organization, the New Dual Movement, were taking over. And he appointed himself prime minister. And one of the first executive orders he issued was to exile Eric Gehry from his home island. Now, it took um, sorting this mess out, was took the next five years. So Eric basically had to drop everything he was doing. He had to, because he was exiled from, he was actually stuck basically in the United States. He had to drop everything to do with UFOs and sort out this mess which I say took about five years. What happened in the end was that Morris Bishop's deputy prime minister, Bernard Cord, staged a coup d'etat against Bishop and actually killed him, killed him and, 70, and 16 others. They were called the Grenada 17. And then the US invaded and, and overthrew Bernard Cord's regime and reinstalled the original constitution, which meant that Sir Eric Gary could then return to, finally in 1983, he could return to his home country. But by then, it was really the impetus that had been lost. He never achieved high political office. And um, the whole momentum generated by the UN General Assembly in 78 was gone. It was ruined. It's, it's a great shame. I don't, think there's any, I don't think there's any conspiracy behind it. It was just bad luck. 
And this, you, now this is interesting here. This is UK foiled Gary on UFOs. This is on the BBC Caribbean website, which claims that the uh, the British um, embassy, the so the British mission to the United Nations, and the ambassador to the United Nations, basically undermines Sir Eric Gary over this particular. Of this particular move that he made to do with UFOs. Now, again, there's nothing really suspicious about it. They just, they didn't want the United they, United Nations associated with this. They thought it was it would bring the UN into disrepute if it dealt with what they regarded, what the British ambassador and his team regarded as lunacy, as nonsense. Which, of course, is what everyone's. Up to that point, everyone was programmed. Everyone was kind of like um, indoctrinated to believe that's what UFOs were. Times have changed, haven't they? I mean, since 2017, that's not quite... Probably this wouldn't happen today. Because I think you can't say that something's nonsense when there's footage of it, which the government admits is real. And here we have Sir Eric Gary addressing the UN, 12th of October, 1978. Um, this famous picture here. Um, so Eric retired to his um, his homeland, and he died in 1997. He's, he's, there's a special memorial for him in uh, Georgetown, the capital settlement of of Grenada. If you're ever on holiday there, and you're sunning yourself on that lovely beach, maybe you could take a moment to nip to the florist, buy a bunch of flowers, and put them on the grave of Sir Eric Gary. A man who'd really tried hard to bring UFOs into the public eye. Of course, the Caribbean is famous for its eccentrics, its mavericks. It tends to uh, produce unusual thinkers. And he was one of the most uh, unusual of those unusual thinkers. And of course, it didn't end there, though. This is Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, speaking again at the... Again, in, in um, Sir Eric's place there at the UN General Assembly, 27th of September 1987. Now, he said something very strange. He was Carter's successor, and he said, um, I sometimes think how different, how quickly our, our worldly differences would go away. I'm paraphrasing, I don't know if this is an exact quote. If we were faced from a threat, by a threat from beyond this earth. And I wonder where he got that... Um, the idea to do that, to say those things from. It's odd, you know, because he may have been talking to President Carter, obviously his predecessor, who met with Gary, as you saw. Also, Carter himself had a sighting. He was actually, um, this is before he was president. He actually saw himself something strange in the sky. And I do wonder if maybe that's where they got the idea from. So I don't, I'm not saying it's possible Reagan was briefed in to some kind of secret. It's it, there's no evidence to suggest that there is incidentally good reason to suggest that the, the current president, Donald Trump, knows more than he's saying that he has actually been briefed into secrets because of the rather it's because some of the statements he's made indicates that um, he knows he knows something about this particular subject that he can't say publicly yet. There's no evidence to suggest that Reagan did, as far as I know, however, it was an odd thing to come out with um, because, of course, us, uh, if there was, for example, nasty aliens out there, then uh, presumably we would have to fight, to fight to defend the Earth as a single planet. And I mean, this is, the, this is the plot line of many of the alien invasion scenarios, such as War of the Worlds or Independence Day. And there's been some good books written in, in that same period. This, 1988, the year after, this came out, Above Top Secret, The Worldwide UFO Cover-Up by Timothy Good. Now, I'll be surprised if you guys have not heard of this. I'm sure some of you probably read this. Absolutely a, a, a seminal work in exopolitical history. Um, in it was uh, several pieces of evidence some people have been questioning, and it's hard to... <coughs> Well, excuse me, hard to know what, what, how real they are. This is the Majestic 12 documents. But it's really one of many really excellent books that Timothy Good has written. <coughs> excuse me. And it carries on. This here, this fine figure is Dr. Stephen Greer. A few years after that book came out in the 90s, 
he formed the Disclosure Project. Very modest man indeed. Incredibly modest. I'm just a country doctor from North Carolina, he says. And um, now he, uh, he, he's, he had a good media presence. He's able to, to be, he's quite good in front of camera. He's quite good on stage. He has been talking about the need to release this planet from the secrecy that it currently suffers on UFOs. And he's done an awful lot since the 90s when he started up his organization to achieve that. This is really quite something. This is the Disclosure Project Press Conference of the National Press Club, Washington, D.C., May the 9th, 2001. This is a long time ago this happened. Now, this was streamed live on the Internet. It's one of the, at the time, this is one of the first times this has been done. I mean, it's quite regularly done nowadays. But back in 2001, it's nearly 20 years ago, the Internet was not as stiff sophisticated as it is now. This was not as common as it is now to stream things live online. But amazingly, this was the most popular, up till that point, online video that had ever been created. There were numerous witnesses, people from military veterans, people from the intelligence services, pilots, air traffic controllers, and Larry Warren, who witnessed the Rendlesham Forest incident, he was there too. And it was quite something quite spectacular to look at. If you've not watched it, you can get it on YouTube. The proceedings were filmed. It was introduced by Dr. Stephen Greer. And um, the proceedings and all the proceedings were filmed after that. And here he is, the man himself at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., which is one of the most prestigious media locations in the entire world. And there he is talking about UFOs, about the need to end UFO secrecy. He had a, this is him having a debate with Kerry Cassidy about um, something I'm going to talk about in a little while because um, there's, it's possible that when the truth comes out about UFOs, it may not be very nice. They always say, be careful what you wish for in case you get it. The truth might be quite disturbing. I'll come on to that in a minute. But again, just like the Gary Initiative, what happened? This. 11th of September 2001, just a few months later, well, you see the world change forever. And again, the momentum was lost. Now, now, some people have said that this happened, September 11th, this, uh, the 9-11 attacks happened because of that press conference. I doubt that, actually. There, there's maybe many reasons why 9-11 was done, and um, it's possible that the UFO issue was one of them, but it certainly wasn't the only one. But again, it was kind of back to square one yet again, just like it was with the, the Bishop coup in Grenada. Uh, but, you know, things carry on. This chap here, this is Stephen Bassett. Wonderful man, this. I've um, I've interviewed him several times. I know him quite well. He's um, you know he's, again he and I have our differences, but you can't deny his dedication. He uh, he spends a lot of his time going all over the world, mostly in in Washington. He spends most of his time in Washington, and sometimes he just sleeps in his car. Amazing chap this is. He's like seventy four now, and he he never slows down. He's starting something called the Disclosure Wire press conference but he has something called the paradigm research group which is very similar to greer he wants to end the truth embargo as he calls it on extraterrestrials and on the decisive evidence that the government are keeping from us about extraterrestrials now we come back to the national press club this time in 2013 where he organized the citizen hearing on disclosure now, the, the, the panel that you see before you are former government officials from the U.S. They're retired now, but he's basically brought them out of retirement to carry out an, um, a, a facsimile of the congressional hearing. Some of which might well come true now, considering everything that's been going on. Now, there's this technically the, the government originally, the original story the, the U.S. government gave out was that it stopped... It stopped investigating UFOs at the closure of Project Blue Book in 1969. There was a, there was a, a conference then where they discussed it, and they concluded there's nothing to see here, nothing of interest. 
and and that was it. The whole thing was closed down. We know that we know that's not true because we know about the the advanced aerial threat identification program. There's probably many many others that have happened since then, and um, a lot of the witnesses who came forward to address these former members of Congress, the U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate, talked about that. What's happening now is that the, the the people who say these sorts of things, it's no longer really crazy to say these sorts of things. Um, if someone like John Brennan and Jaime Shedd can say things like this, anyone can. And what they have said is vindicating much of what the witnesses were saying. Every good movement needs its theorists behind the activists, and this is Richard Dolan. Now, he's an interesting chap because I know he's he's spoken at your group. I mean, um, I've, I've met him several times because he does this conference circuit quite a bit. And um, he actually studied at Oxford, where I live, where he was involved in a history and politics course. And um, what's what happened to him is what often happens with people. They they almost stumble stumble into ufology and exopolitics accidentally. In his case, he was doing his standard history and politics course at um, the Oxford University, and um, he read Above's Top Secret, that book by Timothy Good. He actually read it, and um, he was just he he basically was working through this module, thinking it's just a couple of weeks, and then I can move on to something else. Well, a couple of weeks has become the rest of his life. He basically dropped everything he was doing and started researching UFOs. He's written numerous very good books. He's a very good uh, lecturer as well. And um, always, if you want to know something, it's almost like he's one of these guys you turn to if you want to know something about anything about to do with UFOs. You, this guy probably has the answer somewhere. He's got a good YouTube channel at the moment as well. And this is, this is the question. Do we have a saucer in the hangar? This is a quote by old Nick Pope who doesn't really take it seriously, he says, we can't have a saucer in a hangar that is decisive physical evidence that there is that there are aliens visiting us. Like, same with the, the, the alien body. This is like from the, this is a reproduction of the Roswell incident from the Roswell Museum. We can't have this, says Nick Pope, because if that was true, they tell me I know all about it, he says, because I ran the UFO project to the Ministry of Defence. That's his reasoning. He thinks that they would tell him, they had to tell him if that was the case. But Nick Pope was like the, the, he was like the official ufologist of the country. He was like the guy, every newspaper and TV station had him on speed dial whenever they wanted to do a UFO story. And if I had a saucer in a hangar or a body in the freezer, and I wanted to keep that secret, Nick Pope, the Mr. Ufology of the mainstream media, would be the last man on earth I would tell. But, you know, he's, he's convinced that he would know all about it. And because he doesn't know about it, it can't be true. It's very it's naive, to say the least, if he thinks that. So are we going to see this? Are we going to see old Trumpy come out and do a press conference and say, um, I'm here to tell you that UFOs are real. We've known about it for a long time, and now I'm telling you. Or knowing him, it would probably be on Twitter first, wouldn't it? Yeah, do follow him if you don't already, because that's probably where you hear it first. What about Boris Badenov, our fearless leader? Yes, we UFOs are real. We, we know all about it. We didn't tell you. I'm sorry about that, but we'll make it up to you somehow or other. Now, it it's, would be, if that, that actually happened, it would be incredible beyond belief if that actually happened. It is possible we're going to see that. Or your own prime minister or your own prime minister or president might do the same. It doesn't have to be the UK or the USA. It could be any head of government it could like sir eric gary if sir eric gary was in position now and well, we i think the world would be a very different place if he was around now he was probably born 50 50 years too early that guy i mean great to have someone like him around now um this would be i think this would cause absolute mayhem if this happened but maybe it, it would be a good thing but, you know, the political, the, uh, political structures of the world we have today <clears throat> in most countries don't have, the, they don't have the mechanism to absorb this kind of revelation. It's possible we're being led in that direction. So it's possible someone behind the scenes is building up some kind of um, cultural immunity so we won't completely freak out. 
it should something like this happen. Should one of these two guys or anyone else in their position say those words? They're probably, maybe there's some people who claim this and they may be right that slowly but surely behind the scenes, they're getting us used to the idea. And the way that um, the ATIP footage, the TTSA, things like that, it's all a part of that. Possibly some people even claim that mo several movies, several films from Hollywood also are doing that. They're uh, part of a conditioning program, the manipulating culture, because we know that governments do this. We know that um, in the Cold War, there were all kinds of films came come out about... Um, in the, the beginning of the Cold War, there's so many films are coming out, of, which were propaganda movies, to, w telling everyone about the red threat, you know, the red peril, communists under your bed and things like that. In the Warsaw Pact countries, they had the same, you know, as the evil imperialist aggressor. We've had, there's many, many other examples of that. And we know that organizations like Disney and the BBC have been employed to do things like this. They have been brought in by the government through various psychological think tanks and um, advisory groups, such as the Stanford Research Institute, the Tavistock Institute, to put certain messages out through their productions to make people, as a, as a group, think and feel a certain way. They have, a, they have the ability to do that. Is that what we are seeing now? Now, this could be, as I said, I think it's something that needs to happen one way or another. Because the world is currently in a terrible situation. It's under threat from environmental damage. It's under threat of war with nuclear weapons now. We're, we're too good at destroying each other with, uh, with the possibility of a nuclear exchange, which even in the post-Cold War, Cold War world could happen. If not between... The US and Russia, it could happen between India and Pakistan. It could happen between Israel and another country. It could, in Iran maybe, it, it could happen in something to do with North Korea. This, this really is an intolerable situation. We also have this ter terrible environmental damage being done. Forests are being cut down. The oceans are filling up with plastic litter. Scenes like this, this beautiful countryside, we, we run the risk of losing these. Now, if we knew we were not alone, then we were just one planet in a living universe. It would probably have a beneficial effect on our own relationship with ourselves as people. We would probably treat, us, treat each other with more respect, I think. We certainly would. And what's more, we would... Um, we would possibly learn from some of the evidence that's already gathered that there are ways and means of, for, for example, generating energy without using fossil fuels, which would cut a lot of the environmental damage down in numerous different ways. Of traveling around without uh, building roads everywhere, you have big highways plowing all these trees into the ground. We've got, a, we currently in Britain, where they're building a new railway, the high speed rail link number two, which is devastating and decimating a lot of our green and pleasant land at the moment. They're basically cutting trees down and they're tearing up the ground to build this new railway, which is going to be so expensive that no one, can, no one will probably ever be able to ride on it. It's possible that um, the government know there are ways and means of building flying craft that could make the need for such monstrosities irrelevant. Hmm. That same technology could take some of the poorest people on earth and ele elevate them to a standard of living they've never had before. A lot of the reason why st some places have better standards of living than others has got to do with energy access. If everyone has access to clean, limitless, free energy, there's no reason why we all can't live a very good high standard of living. We could, if we could build things like this, we could... We don't have to. We don't have to live in squalor anymore. We can live dignified lives, productive lives, happy lives. Who's going to object to that? <laughs> yeah, there are some people who wouldn't be very happy. I mean, try. You see, you can't really go up to the 
owners of these companies and say to them, sorry, your services are no longer required? Because I don't think they're going to be very happy about that. I mean, you can't, it'd be a bit tricky to tell these people like Shell, you know, what are you going to say? Don't worry, you can rebrand, you can remodel, there's new markets you can enter. You need oil still to make candles, Shell candles. Hmm. You have a big dollar on that. They smell nice, they're pretty colours, they won't stain your wallpaper. Now, I don't think that the, the, it's possible there are these institutions, even though they don't have any malevolent intentions on, on the world at large, they do understand the need to protect their own industry. It's possibly they are collaborating with this cover up for that reason, simply to protect their own industry as they see it, because they, because they, they can't really envisage, envisage themselves in any other form other than using the conventional technology that you have now. And what would it mean now? What would it mean if we discovered that we were not alone? Because I think, like I said, I, I think it would be beneficial. We'd probably end up treating each other better. We'd be, a, we'd be better people if we knew that the earth was not alone. So how come, and we are not alone. That's absolutely factually correct. But how come we're supposed to be? We're supposed to think that we are, at least until quite recently, we were supposed to think that we are. This is this object here on Mars is said to be just a trick of the light. It just happens to look like a face. However, it's surrounded by many, many other interesting structures. And it's possible that Mars, for example, even if it doesn't have like intelligent life now, it once did in the past, because Mars is um, currently it's very cold. There's very there's there's a thin atmosphere. There's no surface water. There's a lot of ice, but there's no surface water. What if in the past it was different? Because there's evidence to suggest that there was once flowing water on Mars. There were rivers and lakes and things like that, which means it must have had a much denser atmosphere and it must have been an awful lot warmer. Possibly it was Earth-like, maybe a couple of billion years ago when the Earth was just forming. Mars was an Earth-like planet. If that's the case, it's possible life developed there. And even to the point where there was sophisticated life, including an intelligent animal species capable of building things which were so large and so robust that they would be there billions of years later. Now, in 1959, the Brookings Institute issued a report which <coughs> did not, it did not specifically recommend a cover up, but it did say that if the space programs, which was NASA and the, and the other space agencies that were emerging at the time, should they discover life in, in the universe out there, especially even, part, even in the past, even the remains of intelligent life long gone, it wouldn't be an idea to shout it from the rooftops because it might have an effect on the way people think and feel. It would mean that it could be that governments would have trouble dealing with that. And sorry, I'll, I'll, I won't linger on that particular picture, but um, the cattle mutilation phenomenon and alien abduction. To to acknowledge these as real things is going to is going to be very frightening. Sure, a lot of people believe in these things anyway. Yet uh, a lot of people experience them. I know people experience them. Yet to have them confirmed by that Freudian father figure in Washington or the White House or the Royal Palace in Copenhagen would be a completely different matter. It's it's one of those um, the, the little kid like who believes in some like fairies in the garden is secretly quite glad that his dad sort of drags him down to earth and says, "Look, don't worry, man. They, they're not real." Um, that's the Freudian father figure element, and. There's a there's something subconsciously secure um subconsciously comforting for a lot of people that even if they have these ideas, there's going to be somebody high up, some high up official within the state who will sit them down and say, look, look, it's not real. You know, it's not real. Don't worry. It's not real. So even even when they say, yes, it is. It is. I've experienced these things deep down subconsciously. There's supposed to be an element of comfort in the fact that someone within the state is telling them it's not. That's the psychology of a lot of people. When the government turns around and says, oh, actually, yes, it's all true. That's going to be quite, that's going to be something quite, up, there's been a lot of upheaval associated with that. A lot of, that's going to frighten a lot of people. It's going to be something completely new within our society to have that acknowledged 
through conventional channels. And that's something that Trump or Boris Johnson or your prime minister and president is going to have to think about if they do their little disclosure speech. There's also the possibility that um, the same technology that has been secretly salvaged from various covert crash retrieval operations when these things come to grief on the Earth's surface has been not only has the energy been understood, the, uh, the energy and propulsion systems of these craft, but the fact that some of it might have been turned into a weapon. This guy is uh, Paul Hellier, who I mentioned earlier. Apart from Sir Eric Gary, he's probably the most senior figure within the government or former government to speak at a UFO conference. He's, 90, he's about 95, this guy. He still does tours. He's writing a book at the moment. He's holding a copy of Where Did the Towers Go by Dr. Judy Wood, which provides irrefutable evidence that during the destruction of the World Trade Center, some kind of technology was used that well, there's no specific evidence that came from aliens, but it's certainly something that doesn't exist within the, in the normal arsenals of the world's military. It came from somewhere else. Some people connected to Nikola Tesla, who, of course, was not an alien, or some people think he was, but I don't think he was an alien. But this, the whether whoever or wherever this technology came from, whether it was from some lost genius like Nikola Tesla, or whether it was from the debris at the Roswell crash, the connection between these kinds of secrets and UFOs is an unbreakable bond. Questions like that are going to come up. And inevitably, there could be a situation. If you're sitting in your, uh, if, you're a, if you are Boris or Trumpy, this is what you might be worried about. An angry mob with torches and pitchforks coming for you. Because let's face it, I mean, it's, what are they going to do? Promise to bring back school milk? And this, this, is, this is secrets. The secrets they have kept have damaged the environment. They've killed people. They've led to people to live lives of misery. There's been wars for, for oil fields when we didn't need oil. We haven't needed it, for, needed it for a century since Tesla came up with what he did. It's gonna, there's no spin doctor that can really talk them out of this. No speech writer can concoct anything that will really portray them in a good light. And again, that's going to be coming through both the, the, uh, the guys who have to do the speech at the podium for the press and also in the secret boardrooms. <coughs> hmm. they, these points will not be lost on them. And I'll be thinking, well, we're just going to have to continue with the secrecy. But will that happen? Now, Steve Bassett would, took a lot of interest in what Hillary Clinton was saying during her 2016 presidential campaign. Because she made several statements indicating that what well, he believed as she became president, she would be, she would basically come clean about UFOs. She made some speeches during, a, um, she made some speeches in her New Hampshire campaign stop off where she talked about Area 51. She's, uh, she said several other things like that. Of course, she wasn't elected president. And for Steve Bassett, this, for him, that was like the end of the world. He was devastated when she wasn't elected president. I disagree with him, actually. I, I, I have a much higher opinion of President Trump than he does. And I actually did hope that President Trump would do what she was going to do. Now, he hasn't yet, but he still has a chance. For, re for reasons I've been explaining, and possibly now, he has more of an incentive to come forward in his last, what could be his last few weeks in office, and just tell everyone what he knows. See, this is an interesting uh, news article. Here. Hillary Clinton may declassify government UFO secrets. Hmm. It's, um, we'll never know now, but uh, it's, it's what, could, what could have been done by Hillary Clinton, if she, should she be in that position, could be done by someone else. It doesn't have to be an American. It could be Boris Johnson here in Britain. It could be your president or prime minister of Denmark. It could be somewhere, somewhere else. <clears throat> it could be anyone. It could be whoever's Prime Minister of Grenada now. <clears throat> if they want to put their island on the map, they should take a leaf out of Sir Eric Gary's book. This is the border of Area 51. What lies within this border is anyone's guess. But it's so secretive in there that several people there's a lawyer actually representing some people who were 
injured, who one of the people who were serving on the base were injured in an accident and said that um, you've got to argue whether this is even a part of the United States at all, because there's no congressional oversight, there's no executive oversight, even the president doesn't know everything that goes on in there. So is it is Area 51 part of the United States at all, or is it the enclave of some kind of global super government? And that was his quote, not mine. And um, well, this is a this is actually a scene from a film from 1956 called The Earth versus Flying Saucers. One thing we should be on our guard against <coughs> is the possibility that you know, there's one way these government officials could could paint themselves in a good light, and that is if they say the aliens are nasty. Whether they are or not doesn't matter. Just tell everyone they're nasty, they're bad aliens, and they can essentially they can eliminate a lot of the problems they would have faced had they just come out and said there are aliens. If you just come out and say there are aliens, people are going to say, well, how long have you known about this? What have you learned about them? Why have you kept this from us? If Trump or Boris Johnson or someone else comes out and says there are aliens and they're evil and we and they're, they're evil and they're out to get us, they're going to destroy the earth and enslave humanity and put, take us all in their, all in their starships to their star bases and eat us. Remember, to serve man. Remember that Twilight Zone episode? People are going to say, they're going to ask very, they're going to ask very, very different questions if that, if that happened. They're going to say, how can you protect us? What do you need us to do? What do you want from us to save us? So if the, if the governments come out and say there are aliens, but they're bad guys, it may be because they're bad guys, but it may also be they're not bad guys, but they're telling us they're bad guys for that reason, simply for political expediency. The extraterrestrials in truth, anyone who studies extraterrestrials in detail will know that um, there actually are many, many different species that appear to have many different origins. They exhibit a wide variety of behavior. And um, some, most of them appear just to be observing us neutrally. That's what I would say. There are a couple that seem to be very pleasant. I mean, so Mary Rodwell in particular has studied um, children who have encounters with what you might call benevolent ETs. There are others, a minority, like the, the ones connected to the cattle mutilations and the abductions that appear to mean us harm of some kind. However, the majority seem to be quite neutral towards us. I don't believe they're anything to... I'm not afraid of aliens. I'm much more afraid of... Um, members of my own species as a result of this. So uh, we're moving into a, a new era of ufology and exopolitics where the rules are very different. There's no, there's no ridicule and denial anymore. There's acknowledgement, but with a proviso. The information attached to it could be legitimate or it might not be. It's up to us, I think, to ex examine calmly and rationally the kind of things that we're told, the information that we're given. Not to be excessively cynical, but also not to be too trusting. That way, hopefully, we can find our way through this new maze that's been put in front of us to the other side. For all the confusion, for all the disinformation, for all the pitfalls. And um, if there is some new kind of deception approaching, we will be able to see through it and we will be able to neutralize it. And that's my hope. So if any of you have anything you want to ask me, if any of you have anything you want to say, please go ahead because um, I, can, I can answer any questions you're asking. Yes, Ben, I have a question actually. Mm -hmm. um, you see that uh, Luis Elizondo uh, has left TTSA yeah. with uh, two other guys. Um, what's your opinion about that? I'm not sure now. Now, um, Elizondo, yeah, Elizondo has quit TTSA. There's essentially been a split in the TTSA. I just find the tweet he made because he made a very interesting tweet just after that. And um, it was him and um, Chris Mellon as another one. And I can't remember the third one, but it's three of them all together. Um, this is just before Christmas. And he tweeted, a new dawn, new beginning, same friends. 2021 is shaping up to be a banner year. In the midst of shifting into second gear with plenty of room 
for all to jump on board. Thanks to amazing UFO Twitter hashtag and others for your continued support. He hasn't really said much else that to my knowledge, I've not heard him say, make any other comment on why he's decided to leave TTSA or the other two. Um, I, I honestly don't know, except I, there's been several occasions when he has appeared to show some element of frustration. He's appeared to be, um, it's like he wants to tell us things that the board of TTA say are stopping him saying. So there was, I discussed this on the Kev Baker show like a couple of years back and I was saying um, that he, he was being interviewed on Tucker Carlson's show, I think. And you could see quite clearly that he had some information he wanted to tell. <clears throat> and without saying it as many words, it's quite clear that his involvement with TTSA wouldn't allow him to do that. So it could be that when he does more, into when he does more um, interviews, he may have to take a different tone. I don't know. Um, we'll have to see. It's still too soon to know for sure. But I think the answers are going to come, though, eventually. About the crop circle, you were showing as a picture of a, you said it looked like um, a splashed egg. <laughs> it did to me. Well, to me, it was the perfect image of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some say that the pandemic was orchestrated uh, by the aliens to slow us down and giving us an opportunity to make the changes that we really need to make to survive to survive on this planet. You were talking about the the uh, environmental pollution and so. So, what are your thoughts on that? That the the, the pandemic is actually an alien created thing. Yeah, I've I don't know. I mean, that would be quite amazing. It it does actually. It's it's not quite the same proportions, but you have like the circular structure and the little mm -hmm. bits coming off it. Yes. Um, that I've never thought about that, Astrid, to be honest. But it's something that it's something maybe that I'll have to think about. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I mean, suppose so. The idea is that they would that the aliens would put this virus onto the Earth to make us think a certain way or behave a certain way. Is that what you mean? <laughs> yes, because uh, we, we are all slowed down and, you know, locked, uh, locked down. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a way of forcing us to, to stop and think about what we're doing, where we are heading at, which direction we want to go in the future on this planet. That certainly has been the case. <clears throat> I mean, people have been... People, for example, have been working, been working less, and I myself have been working shorter hours than normal. Most people in my situation, they're either working shorter hours or they've not been working at all. They've been furloughed. In other words, let, you know, allowed or put on special leave because of this, which, of course, has given people a lot more free time. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article for UFO Truth magazine, actually, a couple of months ago, UFOs and the lockdown where I mentioned that the number of reports have gone up. Several databases have, re report, have reported an increase in sightings. This could be because people are going to bed later at night because they don't have to get up for work. And they've been looking at the sky more. There's been fewer aircraft and less light pollution. It could be that it will have some kind of positive effect in that respect. So maybe. Um, but uh, I have to think about that. But thanks, Astrid. Nice new idea for me. <clears throat> mm hmm uh, um, my second question is, uh, with all these UFO-related things happening these days, how close to full disclosure do you think we are? In terms of a time scale, I don't know. I mean, I was listening to a radio interview with L.A. Marzuli, who is quite a well-known UFO pundit. And he was saying, he was talking about what's called the rungs to disclosure. He believed that there was a process and basically we'd been through the first three stages of that process, which is kind of like what I, what he suggested is a similar thing that I've thought about that. This is some kind of, um, this is some kind of agenda, which in which people are being exposed to information in a controlled manner, a bit, a bit at a time building up to something. So there's a kind of crescendo feel to all this. And indeed, there's no doubt that the, the uh, revelations on the ATIP from TTSA have come in a series. They've, they've gone, they started off with just the films and no one knew where these videos came from, the footage. 
Then the witnesses came forward, like David Fravor and the other witnesses. Then it was announced ATIP was real because everyone was people like uh, Glenn Greenwald were, were, were very understandably saying, "Well, is, is, does ATIP even exist?" And then it's announced, "Yes, ATIP exists." And then the videos were declassified, sort of retrospectively, because they'd been leaked. And then they, then they would, then they uh, th th that basically was the government admitting the videos were real U.S. Navy footage. It's like. It's like a series of events with a time, there's certain times between them. I don't, I don't know exactly whether it was eight months or six months between each development, but there was some kind of almost like a, a designated time scale between each of these developments, which means we could be seeing something else. Indeed, Marzuli thinks that. He thinks that there's going to be another rung on the ladder, as he called it. <clears throat> so if that's, if that's true, then presumably at some point, we're going to get to the. We are going to get to the full acknowledgement, the full acknowledgement position. Although I don't know specifically because this is completely new ter territory. All I can do is speculate. But um, I'm feeling, I'm feeling hopeful. You know, this is a great time to be into UFOs. Like I said at the beginning, really great time. You know, I, I have an idea about uh, those videos that I've received from the, the TTSA. And, and stuff that it's actually kind of uh, perhaps it could be some kind of, of disinformation to have us look in that direction because if, if they say it's, it's, it's UFOs, we don't know what it is, <coughs> then they can deny it's our own technology. Yeah, this is actually, you know, well, this is something that's been suggested several times by several people that that the UFOs, at least in part, the UFO phenomenon is some kind of engineered modern mythology designed to launder the government's much more down-to-earth secrets. In other words, spy planes, for example, new kinds of aircraft, new kinds of drones. Um, but the problem with that is, though, it's a kind of um, it's the kind of trick that could backfire very easily because they're drawing people's attention towards something with the ultimate intention of deflecting it away. Now, if you do that, it might, you, you, it might work. But on the other hand, if I was the one who had some kind of secret aviation project, I would say absolutely nothing about it at all. I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't say, look, it's UFOs, it's UFOs. I'd just say nothing at all. And um, so that because at some point, if, if you draw people's attention towards something, they'll see aliens. Some, some will look at it and they'll believe you it's aliens, but others will look and they'll see through it and they'll ask the very question that you asked. It's rather like a bank, you know, a bank robber um, who's, who's stolen some money. Now, um, if I'd done that, of course, some of them, they have to bury the, bury the stash in a secret place in the woods, you know. And um, if I was a bank robber, that's what I'd do. I'd just dig a hole, put it in there, and I'd walk away. And, and I, only I would know where that hole was, and I wouldn't tell anyone. And that's probably the best example. Now, what you could do, though, um, if using, using the methods that uh, you've just described, what you could do instead is you could... Uh, you could go and stand on top of the hole uh, with a big placard, which says, there's no money buried here, just unicorn bones. And every time a police car drives past, you could just wave that placard and say, it's all right, guys, there's no money buried here. I'm not a bank robber. You keep going. Now, the chances are that you, that probably wouldn't work as well as my method. Just walk, just dig in a hole, put it in there and walk away and say nothing. And of course, when it comes to aircraft, of course, you can't keep aircraft completely secret. I mean, we, you know about the Aurora, the Aurora spy plane. Yeah. Because several people spotted it, and it's, it's been spotted like in the area of, uh, vicinity of Area 51. Now, um, the, there, there probably is some kind of new secret aviation project being developed at Area 51, a new kind of plane. And there's several people spotted hangars and things. The people who watch it have spotted new hangars being built and things like that. But... Um, Several people have seen sort of large triangular shaped objects appear in the sky, and I've heard people say things like, Well, you know, those flying triangles that appeared in Belgium, they put those up there deliberately, or even that's what they were seeing. But the, you can't completely hide an aircraft, but you can avoid you can do the best you can by flying it over uninhabited areas, um, which means it's unlikely that they would, they would approach the US Navy um, fleet. Is it because the area of these, the areas the Tic Tac and the Gimbal were seen was a uh, quite a well, a quite a well trodden beat by the US Navy. There's an exercise area down there. There's several secret locations on the islands in that area where they they do tests on weapons and things like that. Yeah. 
So it's not a good, not a very good way of keeping something secret, especially and especially if you know if it's your own. For example, I mean, some people said, "Oh, it's Russian or Chinese. It can't be American because if you start doing that to the Americans, they'll, they, people could start shooting and people could get killed." Um, but um, it's probably unlikely to be anything we've made, unless it is some Chinese or Russian drone. I mean, if if so, then we're in trouble. <laughs> they could they could easily conquer us with that kind of technology. So uh, I think America's in big trouble. I just uh, want to ask you uh, the um, the picture of the crop circle, uh, yeah. which I think <laughs> looks like a, a coronavirus. Uh, yeah. When was that taken? Is it, it recent? T- uh... Let me just find out because I've got the actual document here. Hang on. Um, yep, it was actually. Um, oh, sorry, it was May. Yeah, twenty ninth of May, not the sixth of June. I don't know where I got sixth of June from. It was filmed by um, Matthew Williams, who is a guy. He's quite a well-known figure in this thing. He makes crop circles, but he also takes photographs of them from the air because he's got a drone. And this was photographed okay. on the seventh. So it's photographed on the 29th of May, where he made a video, a very good video of it. And the and there's no chance that that he made the crop circle himself. <laughs> he denied. Well, he denies that. I mean, he. It's easy to say. Well, because he was there first on the scene, it could be simply because he made it. And I mean that would fit. But however. He spends so much time exploring that location in the West, English West Country that it's quite likely that he would have spotted. He spots a lot of them first anyway because he's always flying. He has a microlight plane as well, and he often flies over that okay. area. So um, he's always out looking for them. Well, I got the thought to to ask you about the connection between um, coronavirus and um, and the aliens. I never thought uh, of that. J- just because that the alien made crop circles. People say they are messages for for humans in all sort of ways to to make us rethink something or to make us, you know, it's a it's a kind of dialogue. Some say the crop circles, the messages in the crop circles, and it could just be that the coronavirus, you know, the crop circle would tell us that well, the virus is here for a reason. It's it's not all bad, you know. Mm-hmm. That'd be comforting to know it's not all bad. Mm-hmm. But the images, what you find in the crop circles ever since they first appeared, they clearly they must have some kind of meaning, whoever's making them, whether it's subconscious meaning of the people making them or who, whatever other extraterrestrial force and non-human force is making them. And there's all kinds of um, possible messages encoded into them. And a lot of people, there's been a lot of effort and a lot of work has been done trying to decode some of these messages. I know that... People who visit them, and including myself, are often struck by the extraordinary atmosphere inside the crop circles. You do when I go in there, I did feel like I was entering another world. It was some kind of weird. It was a very quite transcendental experience, actually, as if mm-hmm. there was some someone was trying to communicate with me in some way. I didn't know exactly how or what they were saying, but there was definitely an attempt at dialogue, as you said, a, a dialogue between intelligences so it's possible that this is whoever is doing this whatever method they're using to communicate is they're doing it the only way possible most of the crop circles appear to be abstract in form but so there are some which are recognizable shapes and that could be their their rendition of a a coronavirus particle mm-hmm. it could be interesting yeah very very much indeed Okay, just let people know about this. This is Roswell Roising, a novel of disclosure. Now, this is a book I read. It's just a story. It's not real, but it's basically about the book. The story is about everything I've been talking about this evening, but it's in fictional form. It's it's a story about what would happen if we got the truth instead of the lies. What would happen? And this this resulted in two sequels. There's Roswell Revealed and Roswell Redeemed, which you can read after this. It's a trilogy of novels. And if you want to know more about me, then... Just, you could just go to this website, go here. This is um, Hospital Porters Against the New World Order, which is my website, which is actually a series of websites. Um, there's, there's like a YouTube channel, I do a radio show, and there's about there's five different blogs now. And so there's a lot there. There's an awful lot of material there for you to look at. Uh, but you'll find out more about me. And um, if you're interested at all, you can contact me and ask me questions by email. I have an email address, bennyj74 at gmx.co.uk, and there's a link on that website to that. So I really thank you very much, UFO Denmark, once again for hosting me. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I hope we do meet again sometime, and it's been great talking to you online. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much, Ben. Oh, you're it's welcome. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye.